Today, what does baseball have in common with electrons, have in common with my hands? Spin angular momentum. Let's get started. Like energy or regular momentum, angular momentum is a conserved quantity, typically in physical systems. Like energy, Planck's constant h has a lot to say about what values of angular momentum are allowed. Now, last time we learned that angular momentum was a vector quantity, which means it has a magnitude and a direction. We learned that that magnitude was quantized in integral units of h over 2 pi. Uh, that is to say, 1 h over 2 pi radians of rotation. h, of course, has physical units of energy times time, which is angular momentum. We also learned how the direction of angular momentum was quantized in the sense that if we tried to make a specific observation, we were restricted to the specific kinds of angles that we could measure depending upon how that, that direction was measured relative to our observing equipment. That type of angular momentum that we talked about where an object kind of orbits around another one is typically called orbital angular momentum or L. Um, today we're going to be talking about more intrinsic angular momentum or spin, which is represented with an S. And that corresponds to angular momentum of something that you might be familiar with for like a ball spinning, something spinning around in some sense its own axis. Both kinds of angular momenta are important for study of physical systems in quantum mechanics. And so typically when we combine them together, L plus S, we call the total angular momentum J. But today we're going to focus on S. For macroscopic objects like baseballs, for example, it's pretty easy to get a sense of what spin angular momentum means. You can take a ball and spin it. You can throw the ball and give it some spin and that will impact its motion. And to measure its spin is pretty straightforward. You can take like a felt pen, you can draw a little dot on the ball, you can throw the ball with some spin and then film it. And then you can watch and see how that dot moves around the ball as a function of time. And so you can simply count the number of revolutions, the number of times you see that dot in the same spot and divide that by the amount of time it took. Um, and together that will give you the angular frequency. So that taken together with knowledge about the mass of the ball, what it's made out of, and kind of roughly the same size of the ball and the density, all that kinds of stuff, you can figure out what the angular momentum is. Uh, precisely, actually, you can think of it as the so-called moment of inertia times the angular frequency, or in other words, it's two-fifths times the mass of, of the baseball times the radius of that baseball squared times the frequency, the number uh, of times per second the ball is rotating, divided by two pi for 2 pi radians of rotation. Like L, the orbital angular momentum, say of the moon around the Earth, or an electron around an atom, S is a vectorial quantity, and that vectorial quantity is associated to the axis about which that thing is spinning. So typically speaking, we, we specify a positive direction on that axis with the right hand rule. So we take our right hand uh, and put the thumb uh, up, and our fingers curl around the direction in which the ball is spinning, and so that thumb points us to the positive, positive direction. So roughly speaking, for example, the Earth is spinning and the direction of the spin angular momentum of the Earth is, is out the North Pole. For quantum particles, small things like atoms or electrons, it's not possible to draw on them with a felt pen. So you might ask, well, how exactly do we measure their spin angular momentum? That's an excellent question, and for that we're going to have to do a small aside to, just to talk about magnetic moments in particle physics. Particles carry more properties than just like their mass and their electric charge, for example. They carry a bunch of other things with them too. One of those things often is a tiny little magnetic field. Uh, specifically, it's, it, it's a dipole magnetic field in the sense that there's a north pole and a south pole. And what's nice about dipole magnetic fields is they specify a vector, <laughs> an orientation, and that vector orientation of a dipole magnetic field is lined up precisely with the spin of a particle. Now, why should that be? Well, <clears throat> charged particles like electrons generate an electric field all by their own. And when charges, electric charges move according to classical electrodynamics, they generate magnetic fields. 
And so if you have a charged ball of something and you cause it to spin about its own axis, you will in fact generate a magnetic field that has a direction that has a magnetic dipole like character to it. So the details on how this works with particle physics is uh, a long and complicated story relevant for particle physicists, not for necessarily us today. So suffice it to say, particles like atoms and electrons and even neutral stuff like neutrons do have some magnetic dipole uh, character to them. There's a magnetic field, a tiny little magnetic field associated to those particles. As we said, that magnetic field is actually aligned perfectly, naturally, with the spin of that particle. And so in some sense, measuring its angular momentum, its spin angular momentum, is the same thing as measuring its magnetic field. They are the same vector, up to a constant of proportionality. Now, the dipole magnetic field character is a complicated function of radius <laughs> and angle, and it's probably not do worth talking about other than just presenting to, to, to confirm that it is, in fact, complicated. But typically, we parameterize this complicated function with a constant vector, uh, mu, that we refer to as the magnetic dipole moment, which you can think of as something that specifies the magnitude of the magnetic field, as well as the direction but it's a constant, it's a nice parameter, something that we can observe and tack on as a fundamental feature of individual particles. What's nice about mu is that it measures really well, and here's what I mean. So magnetic fields tend to align with one another. You've seen this if you've used a compass on the Earth, it aligns with the magnetic field of the Earth. Similarly, if you have a really big magnetic field and you have a bunch of atoms that have tiny little magnetic dipole moments, they're all going to want to rotate to align their magnetic fields with the magnetic field you've applied. In other words, that applied magnetic field puts a torque, a tiny little torque on those little particles via their magnetic field. And that torque has a very simple representation in terms of that magnetic dipole moment parameter, that constant vector mu. That is to say, a torque is equal to mu cross the magnetic field. In other words, the magnitude of that torque is the magnitude of that dipole moment vector, that parameter, <laughs> times the magnitude of the magnetic field, times the sine of the angle between them. E it, it relatively easy and straightforward, which is why we talk about magnetic dipole moments. Suffice it to say, when we talk about measuring the spin of individual particles in quantum mechanics, typically what we're going to be doing is measuring their magnetic dipole moment. Now that we have a rough understanding of what spin angular momentum is and how we can measure the spin angular momentum of a given quantum particle, it's worth pointing out that there's one more refinement that we need to understand that separates spin angular momentum associated to a quantum particle from orbital angular momentum. And that has to do with the concept of chirality. Many objects in nature, especially in our three-dimensional universe, uh, have a notion of handedness to them. For example, molecules like uh, amino acids come in two stereoisomers, a left-handed version and a right-handed version. The left-handed versions of those amino acids are the chemicals that our body and, and life as we know it utilizes <laughs> to, to build up proteins and so on. The right-handed and, and yeah, the right-handed stereoisomers are uh, kind of neglected. They're not even created in any kind of biological sense. They're created only artificially. Uh, similarly, particles like electrons, protons, neutrons have a sense of handedness to them. Not all particles, but some particles and some very important particles. Put differently, all particles, be they atoms, be they fundamental particles like electrons, protons, uh, photons even, have a sense of either being chiral, that is to say having a handedness to them, or being achiral, or not having a handedness to them. Chiral particles have magnitudes of spin angular momentum that are slightly refined. That is to say they have units of h over 4 pi, Whereas non-handed particles, non-chiral particles like the photon have integral units, familiar units uh, of angular momentum, that is to say h over 2 pi. And to get an understanding of, of why a handed particle should have extra, uh, an extra factor of one half in, in its um, set of possible angular momentum states, it's worth thinking about one other thing that definitely carries a notion of chirality or handedness to it, and that is our hands. If you consider uh, the right human hand, and we, we can rotate it through two pi radians, 
And while the hand itself appears to be back where it started, it certainly is not comfortable for the rest of the arm. Indeed, to fully get back to where we started, we have to rotate through another two pi radians. In other words, to get my right hand back to where it started, I have to rotate through four pi radians to do a full rotation of something that's handed. And you can try it yourself with your left hand as well. Same story. So from this heuristic perspective, <laughs> we can think of we have h units of angular momentum to distribute amongst four pi rotations of a handed particle. Th this is just a, a kind of a convenient mnemonic that I picked up from my quantum mechanics professor in grad school, Tsui Chin. Uh, so don't read too much into that correlation other than to say that, it, that um, particles, fermions, particles that are handed, that are chiral, have this aspect to them. In other words, we can distribute that h amongst four pi radians. Why some particles are handed and chiral and why some aren't is a better question for much further down the road. But it does bring up one important point, a final important point about angular momentum, uh, spin angular momentum of individual quantum particles. Finally, let's talk about what separates spin angular momentum from orbital angular momentum. So an electron orbiting in an atom, that orbital angular momentum can be spun up in principle by just adding more and more photonic energy to it. In other words, we can change its orbital angular momentum by changing its energy, energy state and by, by excite, exciting that molecule. Similarly, as you'll see in the exercises, molecules themselves can pick up some, some orbital rotational angular momentum that you can you can ramp up or down by adding photonic energy, but spin, spin angular momentum is fixed. That's right, the species of particle determines the spin of the angular momentum, just like a species of particle determines its charge or its magnetic moment <laughs> or its mass, spin is fixed just by specifying what the particle is. So all protons, for example, have a spin of h over four pi. Similarly, all electrons, all silver atoms have a spin of h over four pi. It never speeds up, it never slows down. The only thing that can happen is it can change direction. And that is of course important for when we observe <laughs> the projection of the spin angular momentum along some specific direction. So let's do a few examples. So an electron or a proton or a silver atom has a spin angular momentum of h over four pi, which means that we can only ever measure its spin uh, as h over four pi or minus h over four pi. Because to measure anything in between an integral unit, let's say zero, would present it as an achiral or non-handed particle. Uh, put differently, there are only two angles that we can measure uh, the spin of an electron or a proton or a silver atom at. We can either measure it at zero degrees or 180 degrees. And those correspond to an odd number times h over four pi. Similarly, pions, pions never speed up or never slow down their spin because their spin is precisely equal to zero. So their, their angular momentum uh, is always zero, so there's nothing to measure. <laughs> but you might ask, okay, so for the case of a deuteron, a deuteron is a hydrogen atom with an extra neutron in its nucleus. So it's a proton neutron with an electron orbiting around it. It has a spin of h over two pi, an even number times h over four pi. And it must always be measured <laughs> in units of an even number times h over four pi. And so that means that kind of similar to our p orbital discussion the last time, you can measure the spin of a deuteron uh, if you project it along a specific direction to be h over two pi, zero, or minus h over two pi, meaning those corresponds to the angles, familiar angles at this point, zero degrees, 90 degrees, and 180 degrees. Uh, finally, for this example, let's consider the delta baryon. The delta baryon is kind of like an excited state of the proton. It's a big fat proton. You can think of it that way. And it has a spin angular momentum, a, a magnitude of its spin angular momentum given by three H over four pi. We've been battling our battery pack all day. So let's just finish this guy off. Again, the delta baryon has a spin angular momentum proportional to three H over four pi. And so what that tells us is that since we must always measure it as a chiral particle, because it's an odd number times H over four pi, the allowed values that angular momentum were allowed to observe in its, in its projection, say along some direction are three H over four pi, one H over four pi, minus one H over four pi, or minus three H over four pi. Put differently, there are four four specific angles that we're allowed to measure um, associated to, to 
at the direction of its angular momentum relative to the detector. And we can generalize this essentially by saying that for an, a particle that has n units of angular momentum times h over 4 pi, we have n plus 1 possible angles that we can measure. If n is an odd number, that particle has a chiral notion to it, and there will be an even number of angles that we can measure. If n is an even number, like the deuteron, then we will always observe it to have a, 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 a chiral or not handed <laughs> spin angular momentum. And so there will be an odd number uh, of angles that we will be able to measure that particle's spin at, much like the case for orbital angular momentum. In other words, a chiral particles behave a lot like orbital angular momentum, but those chiral particles, they're just a little bit special. Okay, so that concludes our discussion of angular momentum for today. Next time, we're going to put all these ideas together and talk about how actively you can build an experiment specifically to measure the spin of a chiral particle like the silver atom. And in fact, we'll describe the stern gerlach experiment, which was the first such experiment to do so. See you then. Thank you.